We are recording live. in progress. Good afternoon and welcome to the January 24, 2024 City Council Work Session. Thank you for joining us in this virtual meeting format. For work sessions like this one where there is no opportunity for public comment, those wishing to access the meeting can do so by watching the live stream available on our website, the broadcast on Comcast Channel 21, or by calling into one of the phone numbers listed for this meeting on the public webcast and meeting materials web page. And with that, I uh, thank you all for joining us and I call this work session to order and I will turn it over to the city manager for the first uh, topic. Thank you so much, Mayor. Uh, as you know, we were planned and scheduled to have a work session last week to update you on a number of fire and EMS items with Chief Caven. We had to delay that based on the storm and today's really your full time is going to kind of morph from a fire and EMS update into storm response, starting with Chief Caven. And then we have a number of folks here from Public Works. Matt Rodriguez, our assistant city manager, is going to sort of lead the second piece of this to talk about the rest of our storm response. So with that, I think I'm kicking it over to Chief Caven for the first part. Thank you, uh, Mayor and Council, for the opportunity to kind of update you on things that are going on with uh, ESF made some brief adjustments to the presentation uh, for the order of information today. So uh, we've got some storm update information to share as well. We'll shift that to the, the back end of the slide. So we have a pretty smooth transition. Um, my goal will be, you know, instead of getting through 100% of my part of the presentation before opening up for questions, um, I'll stop short of the kind of fire and EMS storm response, allow you to ask any questions on our regular update stuff. And then move into our fire or our storm response update so that it just kind of flows and um, we don't get too buried in, in questions. So um, with that, I'm going to share my screen and uh, open up my presentation here. Right. This is mostly just to keep me in line. Okay, so um, again, like City Manager Madari said, we uh, really just kind of, we're going to provide an update on a number of things that are going on from hospital closures to EMS changes and and then really wrap it up with some of our challenges and what we're looking forward to in 2024, um, you know, governance and, and other um, planning and goals work that we've got going here in FIRE. So lots to cover. Uh, hopefully that it, it, it fits well and, and kind of gets you guys grounded in um, where we are. First and foremost, obviously at the front of mind is the uh, university district uh, hospital closure. Um, you know, I've done a couple uh, radio and TV interviews over the last week where uh, this subject was a, a common question about, you know, what did we see and, and you know, would it have made a difference uh, in our emergency response capabilities had the university district been open? Um, and, and some followed up with a question, you know, hospital said really doesn't, for them didn't change anything. Because with the, the staff that they have, they, you know, they can only serve so many people, right? And uh, all in all, uh, you know, that's true. Uh, but at the same time, if both hospitals were uh, effectively staffed, um, it would have made a big difference in our ability to respond. So we talked about last fall, <clears throat> the fact that uh, ambulance response times, uh, you know, or, or travel times from university district to uh, Riverbend or from other places, we're going to, you know, exceed uh, a total of 4,000 hours throughout the year, right? Um, had the hospital been available in downtown, um, when you think about our vehicles, when they're chained up in a nice event like this, you can only go 25 miles an hour, if that, um, safely with our patients and the fact that we're that much further away traveling back into the city. Um, and so, the answer to that question is yes, absolutely. It would have made a difference in our resource availability. Um, and there'll be a little bit of theme about that throughout this presentation is just our resource availability, um, dealing with normal daily operations and then uh, the ice storm and, and how we're able to weather that. Um, but as you know, the ER did formally close on December 1st. Uh, the urgent care from West Eugene moved into downtown at the same time. Uh, during the month of December, like we talked with council, we added an additional ambulance and we added a squad to the street so that we had 
transport capacity and we had a uh, first response capacity. So we could understand um, what were the community's patterns for getting access to care going to be. Uh, that worked out really well. The squad ran about 250 calls for service in the month of December. It wasn't staffed every day. We were, we were cognizant of kind of what we were asking our staff to do covering vac regular vacancies anyways. Um, and so we did stand it up on the, the holidays. Um, the existing crews covered those uh, calls. But what we saw in December was our overall call volume um, and we're, we're still trying to sort through how and why outside of some adjustments we made to our response patterns uh, later, you know, late in 2023, but we're down 9% system wide. Um, but in the downtown core, Station 1's response area where University Hospital is, um, they actually saw a 5% increase in uh, service volume. And so as far as patterns go, um, people were, were accessing 911 more in the downtown core. Uh, than they had been uh, in the rest of the city. And so we didn't see that that relief in, in overall calls. Um, I'm going to move on to uh, APOT, which are the uh, ambulance patient offload Chief, times. Chief, um, can I, yeah. I'm sorry, um, sorry to interrupt. Um, your screen is, is not sharing the full presentation right now. Can you click on that? Um, it looks like a screen icon kind of in the middle. Yeah, no, oh, wrong one. Oh, oh boy. Yep, so the one right in the middle. Yeah, tried that. Well, that didn't work. Let Hold me... on, the display setting up at the top. We're trying to, sorry, we're trying to configure. Duplicate there slideshow, there you go, yeah. Thank you. Is that better? Oh, no. st still no. black. There we go. Oh, there we go. Thank you. Go. Sorry, Chief. Thank you. Thanks, Chief. <laughs> I didn't notice that you were seeing the, the presenter version. Um, anyways, so uh, ambulance patient offload times, this was one of our biggest concerns. Uh, as you recall, uh, really for you know years, as you see with the dates down below, um, has been a problem for us. And you know we were promised that moving the staff from University District to Riverbend uh, was going to create uh, capacity uh, more nurses, more availability, more rooms, more patient flow. Um, and what you see here from November to December is uh, an increase. Obviously, notably, um, the light blue colors, it was University District, um, got folded into uh, the rest for Riverbend. And so we saw those go up. Um, you know, we, we started implementing a fee uh, for the APOT time in this fiscal year. And uh, at the end of December, we issued our second uh, quarterly bill to the hospitals and the total amount charged for uh, APOT times was effectively the same. So it was $336,000 in the first quarter um, or really what would be the third quarter of calendar year 23 and the fourth quarter was $337,000. And so um, what we haven't seen is an improvement in that space. Um, and that it comes with a lot of coordination with our EMS field supervisors in helping navigate patients and flow in the hospital, uh, getting people out, getting rooms for our folks. And so um, we've got an eye on that. Obviously, now with what just happened last week, um, January's data is not going to be reliable for us on what kind of the normal operating, are things improving or not improving. Um, I'll touch a little bit more on it when we get to the ice storm updates, but uh, we had tremendous wait times in our emergency rooms, but they're overwhelmed. Uh, and, you know, and I will note that uh, the hospitals in uh, Eugene Springfield Fire and uh, Lane County work really closely together to figure out how to get people moving through the hospitals um, that we're accessing. So um, overall, yes, there's been a system impact. It hasn't been incredibly catastrophic to our ability to meet uh, the community's needs. Uh, however, you know, it has been problematic for sure. So what are we doing about it? Last time we, we visited you all, uh, we were talking about the IGR support plan uh, moving into uh, this short legislative session. And uh, I'm going to flip the script here a little bit at the measure 110 impact on there. I'm going to drop that to the, the bottom as we talk about this. But 
um, Rep. Nathanson, uh, Mayor Venice, and a number of other community stakeholders, uh, Manager McGarry and Assistant City Manager uh, Hammett, uh, we all participated in some group sessions thinking about what are the community's needs, what are the, the county's needs, um, and we've been advocating all along that we knew we would need some transport capacity and we need help funding um, alternative options for the 911 system. And there are really three at capacity in that space. Uh, the bill, the emergency funding bill, as it moves through um, or is preparing to move through hearings and get to the floor of the legislature includes uh, funding for two years to staff uh, 12 hours or peak hour uh, basic life support, transport capacity. Uh, and then also uh, what evolved into uh, an innovation fund. Um, and so that means as it stands, uh, the bill carves out a direct pass through from Lane County to the city of Eugene to fund the ambulance. And then the balance of, of the investment, um, which is an additional, I want to say four and a half million dollars. I don't have that, that number in front of me directly at the moment. Um, is funding for innovation. Um, we worked closely with the county. Uh, Chief Heppel did a tremendous amount of work on this uh, with Representative Nathanson, uh, Ethan, and then um, in coordination with Lane County um, to make sure that in the innovation fund that it's clear what it's asking. asking for. The first vision version really talked about access to care, um, and that speaks to really clinic access or day of access to medical care. Um, that's been updated to include uh, 911 prevention and ER diversion, uh, which those programs feed right into the things that we've been talking to you all about. Uh, nurse navigation, uh, which uh, city staff and, and some elected officials participated in a presentation about that. Um, and some other functions, community paramedics could be a, a piece in there. But the, the second biggest ask that we had um, in this process was the community response. That being the two person um, squad concept where you have two people who are able to deal with people's you know, access to care needs and more kind of intensive, you know, how do we help them navigate the system? How do we get them to the right places? Because um, we have a lot of users, the, the hospital system and, and health and human services, um, we begin to re refer to those as the friendly faces. So it's the, the group of community members who's needs aren't being met and so they're accessing um, the more critical or emergency um, access systems far more frequently and so they would they would be able to help navigate in that space um, and so again we're, we're grateful for the support and in particular for uh, council's support in uh, agreeing that this issue was uh, a top priority for the city of eugene in this legislative session so um, we are very thankful for for that support um, we feel confident uh, Chief Heppel has been been doing some work meeting with uh, other elected officials and kind of talking about prepping uh, the committees to hear what what are we accessing, why. Um, I think for the council, just to, to understand, I mean, you hear a lot of discussion about this need that we have in Lane County's role in that. Um, it, in that space, it's as simply as for the legislature to, to pick and choose individual communities in the, in the state that need a specific thing versus um you know county public health issue a 911 and ambulance system which are all run by the county um that it makes more sense to say here's here's this funding here's a direct path through um to address ambulance transport but then um, work together on innovation and those long-term solutions um to which uh you know our conversations with uh, county staff have been great i think we're we're going to be kind of arm in arm as we talk about um, what we're trying to do um, in that innovation space uh, to the measure 110 impact piece, um, you know, as you, most all of our, our governmental entities, as we move into this session and into this year, um, are talking about how to how to address the impacts or the unintended impacts to the community. Um, and I just wanted to share with you all as we wrapped up 2023 and we're going through our statistics, um, you know, what did we see as far as overdoses and overdose deaths? And, and we pretty much averaged... Um, well over 100 calls for overdoses per month, and an average of 35 of those or more every month uh, resulted in somebody's death. And, you know, I, I think to put it in perspective, as we talk about 
this problem. Um, and I didn't come up with this myself. I grabbed it from, from someone else who said, you know, we're responsible for providing uh, aircraft rescue and firefighting at the Eugene Airport. Many of our regional carriers, uh, they fly airplanes um, usually that are capped at um, 79. We're growing, so we have much bigger planes now. But historically, that was kind of the normal number of people that were flying into the airport. So imagine that every single month at the Eugene Airport, a plane crashed. Everybody was injured, and 35 of those people died. Just one event of that. Um, would be something that would leave a mark on this community for decades. We're seeing it play out every single month in this overdose crisis. Um, and so, um, you know, these are people's family members, people they care about. So we're we're glad that everybody's taken this serious. And just wanted you guys to have that 2023 updated information for uh, our response to the overdose crisis. Um, next, and this is in alignment with uh, what we're talking about with IGR, uh, but also what we have been talking about with alternative response planning and um, the future there. Uh, as you know, when CAHOOTS came under FIRE's umbrella in this fiscal year, um, or this biennial budget, uh, came with an alternative response planning position. We've been working through some iterations. We were really close with a candidate, unfortunately, um, got a different job offer in the 11th hour. Um, we've kind of got a, a new um, adjustment to the team that's working on this and how not only can we focus on alternative response planning for city of Eugene, but a way to hold uh, a, a Springfield staff position uh, into supporting the, the work as well. And so we're kind of doing one system across the board. Um, but this was a, a network that the uh, EMS in division was working on, uh, developed, but basically it's like, how do we deal with alternative ways to solve people's problems. Obviously, 911 is the most common access. There's emergent response. We, we, that won't change for us. But how do we how do we facilitate through um, triage or nurse navigation um, different places for people? You know, is there an immediate threat to life? Um, do they need referred to a, a true traditional nurse line? Is the community response unit the next role? Um, cahoots and how do they support in that space? Uh, other street outreach programs for, for people who are kind of down on their luck or need some additional help um, and support out there. Um, 988, which is the behavioral health version of 911. Um, and then other future resources that, you know, we haven't thought about um, as we as we survey uh, how to provide this service. And so it really is becoming uh, a pretty wide network. And, you know, how do we serve the community? How do we get them access to care? Um, and how do we make sure that the emergency resources are available um, when needed for actual emergency? Um, with that, uh, it's a good opportunity to move into uh, some discussion about CAHOOTS. Um, we've all heard a little bit here and there about you know, challenges. Um, the county, as of January 1st, is responsible for behavioral health crisis response. Um, we've been working with them and Cahoots um, and Whitebird with what are they capable of? Um, or do they intend to do that work? Kind of what the future is there? Um, I don't want to specifically speak for Whitebird or Cahoots um, in this space, but uh, what I want folks to understand is where we've been with them and the conversations that we've been having. Um, as we were moving into the end of 2023, uh, Whitebird got a new CEO or an interim CEO, which I believe um, he is now formerly the CEO, um, and then a consultant that was working with him to um, really figure out what is the structure, what are the needs in the organization. But what I want to share is is that team and the work that the, um, the board of Whiteboard or White Bird uh, specifically have done a lot of work to look at structurally as an organization, how do they operate, how do they function, because not unlike our own service, right? Um, the expectations of community health, behavioral health, everything that that awesome organization does for our community um, kind of just kept growing and it's expanding. And so they're working on getting their arms around it and saying, okay, what do we do? What are we required to do? How do we meet our contractual obligations for the city, the county, uh, Springfield, and um, this new, uh, set of rules for the county for behavioral health crisis response and, and can they? Um, so as the year was rounding out, there was some question from Whitebird 
um, and us, like, could they continue to do the work? Did they have the qualifications necessary? And so we were intently um, supporting them and kind of working through the county's RFP process, providing guidance, um, and offering however, whatever the future of, of that organization looks like. Um, we want to maintain our relationship um, because they do provide a critical service from behavioral health crisis response to some of this alternative medical care um, that people struggle to access out on the streets. And so um, it's been a, a great, have a, a tremendous amount of confidence in the team that, that's running that. Um, they're, they're not done yet um, filtering and having conversations with the county on how they're going to perform. But the one thing they're committed to do um, is increasing their service level to make sure that they're meeting uh, the contractual obligations with the city. And we continue to, to really look forward of what does the next contract look like? Um, and because of them trying to, to reorganize and really get their core mission tied tightly together and staff seeing the vision and moving towards that, um, we're really not sure we haven't drafted or, or prepped the RFP to extend their contract um, past its expiration in, in uh, June. Um, but again, we're, we're really confident we're at the table with them um, frequently, um, looking at what our needs are, how might they meet the county's needs in that space, um, and, and really uh, making sure that at the end of the day that our safety net, county safety net, um, catches our communities most vulnerable um, where they're needed, and they're getting the right resources. We heard that in the alternative response um, consultants report, right, is um, there's a lot of things that we're asking cahoots to do to take calls out of the 911 system that um, aren't necessarily in their mission set. You know, so as we evaluate what they're going to do and then what our needs are, uh, making sure that they're tailoring the right types of units to the county needs and, um, and in this case, the city's needs uh, for that alternative response. And so um, it's exciting. Uh, you know, so there's obviously going to be a lot of conversations in the community as staff that have been with Cahoots for a long time grapple with what's the future look like and, and how do they provide that service. They're a tremendously uh, passionate, dedicated group of people to the, the mission that they have. Um, and so we're really happy as we see this evolve from um, what honestly in the beginning was, are we, are we going to oversee or help navigate through Cahoots not being here anymore? Um, and the reality is that's not the case. Um, as they've moved through it, a lot of their staff have the qualifications to meet the new OAR guidelines for how they would get reimbursement for their work. Um, so from what we're seeing, there's a lot of good progress and a lot of good signs that um, CAHOOTS 2.0 is going to come out of this. What's it look like? How do they operate? How do they take care of their staff? Um, all of those things are at front of mind and, and I think they're in a, a good space. Um, Real quickly to the ice storm, this picture is them operating in the ice storm. I just want to make sure council knew, you know, there's some narratives out there. What you know, was Cahoots running or were they not running? Um, they were running. Um, in particular here in Eugene, there was some uh, access and, and issues out in Springfield that were challenges for a little while. Um, but here in Eugene, um, they they ran uh, beside us uh, throughout the emergency. They struggled for to maintain 24 hour coverage sometimes. Um, but with the staff that they've got, they were really flexible and, and they were um, making an impact out on the street. Apparently it's a uh, monthly emergency alert test. <laughs> um, I'll touch on our EMS redesign real quick. I mean, we did a work session last year, kind of forecasting what we were gonna do, um, how this system was working and happy to report that we're we're on track with, uh, you know, we've, we've hired and trained um, enough people that two full-time single role ambulances are out on the street. Uh, the third one, we're just wrapping up some field training with folks for depth and are looking at uh, standing up the third. Um, and we've got 30 applicants that are interviewing this week for the single role EMT position uh, to help us kind of finish what that original plan was. Uh, we've been very happy with uh, those crews, their teams, um, the system and how it's operating. Uh, we do have our eyes on the challenges, um, which has been long-term challenges with ambulances, how busy they are, 
um, the limited number that we have in workloads. Um, and so we're reevaluating their shift schedule um, to make sure that um, the shifts we're asking them to work and how those are organized uh, don't become too much, that uh, we don't get into a, a long-term fatigue issue uh, that's not good for mental health recovery and physical health. And um, so we continue to work through that. Um, as we move into 2024, we'll be bargaining a, a new contract with the IAFF. Um, this issue and, and caring for these staff who were dedicated just to uh, EMS uh, are well cared for. And, and um, uh, again, they're doing great work. Uh, we moved the first group, as you recall, um, that we hired were folks who had applied to be firefighter paramedics. And we said, hey, we need to do something. We need to do something innovative. We want you to be a part of it. Um, and we keep our word. You applied to be firefighters. We'll move you into the academy. Um, one great component of that this fall, they went through the fire academy as promised. Um, the fact that they had the field experience, experience in our organization, uh, allowed them to focus just on fire training. Uh, and they came out of the academy well prepared for this job, uh, better than we've been able to prepare folks in a long time. And so some of the downstream consequences or, or impacts that we were um, thinking about have really played out in this system, how we allow people access to a career at Eugene Springfield Fire sooner and how we navigate them to the places that they want to be, whether um, it's focusing on EMS leadership and planning positions or moving over uh, and serving the community as a firefighter. So really happy. Um, the 24-hour EMS supervision that we funded through uh, FTE savings, um, those positions went into effect this summer and um, they've been growing and learning and supporting the system. Uh, they were, you know, excellent during the ice storm and their ability to help navigate issues at the hospitals, get ambulances, what they need uh, to keep the crews moving from call to call. I'm really happy with, with how this is going. When you think about future direction, uh, you know, we're in conversations right now uh, and our, our plan is leaning towards uh, our ambulance transport system will become all uh, single role positions, uh, you know, still continue to be ALS first response uh, on our fire engines, uh, but really leaning into that medical field and that workforce that is, is interested in that space. And so uh, programs moving along, we're really happy with uh, the results. Uh, governance update. So um, we know you guys have heard a lot about this and we're getting close to um, a time where we'll be able to have discussions with not only our governance panel, but the whole council. Uh, so we began this in spring of 2022, and there are some challenges with, uh, you know, the information available, the vendor, kind of what we were looking at, um, and the expertise that the vendor had in uh, alternative ways to, to govern or, um, you know, support our services. And so, we took a pause, we took a look at seeing if we figure some of this out with the city teams. Um, but as you know, both of our cities are, are in a space where, uh, you know, finance teams are, are have a heavy lift in kind of dealing with uh, tax or revenue issues um, that are affecting everybody in the state. Uh, and so this last fall of 2023, we put our heads together and thought about um, who might be out there, um, especially with the, the team from AP Triton who was hired um, did a revenue analysis for us, did some really good work, and had great insight on our services and what we do. And um, so we put out a, an RFP and moved um, to work with them on the governance review, and uh, we're really happy so far. So this all started with our kickoff uh, August 10th of 2023. Uh, we started uploading all the data that they needed. Um, by the end of August, we had a meeting with the governance review panel to get everybody kind of back up to speed, re-energized, and what are we doing? Why are we doing it? And what do what do they see? What do they what do they want? And uh, Brenda Wilson from LCOG has been facilitating that for us um, in a partnership with the assistant city managers, uh, helping me coordinate uh, the meetings and, and the overall work product. Um, in October 9th, we got all the our data updated. Um, at the end of October and early November. Um, some of you or many of you had an opportunity to speak with them, um, share your insights about what you see, what's the best fit, um, what you want out of your fire department. 
Um, and then by uh, early December, we had received um, their preliminary report of our current condition. And if that work is indicative of the final product of our options for governance, um, we're going to be in, in really good hands um, in that space. So um, we did our work. We made our edits. It's now back with the city team. So finance, social services, all the other folks who support uh, fire and EMS um, to provide their feedback. But we're on track and we should um, be back before the council around the end of February uh, for kind of an update as we move into um, formal report distribution at the end of March and early April, um, which will lead to the, the discussions for guidance. Um, let's move backwards. Uh, 2024 goals and challenges. Um, our challenges continue to be staffing. Um, you know, we are an incredibly busy fire department. Uh, we made some adjustments in the types of calls that we uh, respond to that kept our 2022 to 2023 uh, response statistics relatively flat. Uh, which is good, but uh, we also capped over 100,000 individual unit responses last year, um, which is a lot. Um, any given day, we're out of resources uh, here in the in the city um, or really low on them. And so as we think about the future, is what are the types of um, staffing that we need? What types of resources will help us meet the, the call demands um, and really um, address the fire problem as our, our city grows and the complexity of uh, operating the fire department grows with it. And I know you all are, are kind of working through uh, the revenue discussion and, and figuring out how to stabilize where we where we are as a city um, and how to fund some of the, the critical needs. Uh, goals for 2024, um, we're working through our divisions and making sure that the titles of what we do fit our, our mission set, um, thinking about uh, fire marshal's office and the fact that they have a big role in community resilience, uh, but also refreshing our standards of cover and these reports that you all rely on um, to understand in writing kind of what we do here at Eugene Springfield Fire and guide your policy level decision making. And so those are big goals, refreshing um, our uh, recruitment and uh, retention abilities, our communications with the, the community and leveraging our use of, of technology. Um, we're excited to, to pursue those goals and get that done here in 2024. Um, one of the big ones we're excited for um, is leveraging some CSI investment in wildfire planning and fuels mitigation. Um, and so we'll be uh, appointing a, a wildfire planning and fuels mitigation manager here and providing a materials and services budget to help with uh, uh, fuels reduction. And so um, that's going to be uh, I think a big noticeable impact to our community because those are those are processes that we haven't really been able to uh, tackle with our current staffing. Um, so, with that, I'll open for questions before I move into the yeah, ES to the ice storm update. Sorry, my mute button was sticking. Thank you. That was uh, a, a really extraordinary. So I'm I needing to sort of see if I can see everybody. I had. Matt had his hand raised initially, so I think Matt and then Alan. Well, thanks, Mayor, and, and thank you, Chief, for the um, for the analysis and the presentation. Um, I, ha I have a couple questions uh, that that cropped up and rise to the top of of, of, of my thinking uh, as your presentation went on. Um, so, thank you, Mayor, for the opportunity to to kick this conversation off. Cahoots and the wildfire mitigation management piece um, jump to the top of, of my um, my questions and concerns. Are we historically, I know his, this has been parked, so maybe this is more of a, a question for Manager Maderi. Have we historically been in a position when Cahoots was parked under law enforcement that we would be five months out uh, without a, a, a contract signed for the next biennium? Um, it's not unusual with any of our contracts to extend for short amounts of time while we work through any specifics, but I don't know of a time we've worked without a contract. That would be unusual. Okay. That, that's helpful. Thank you. Um, the wildfire management piece, um, what, if any chief, is the 
community outreach, recognizing fully that here in the South Hills and, and through our, our neighborhood association in particular, um, there's been a lot of um, education, um, awareness, uh, uh, community-led uh, kind of uh, ladders of communication uh, when it comes to uh, mitigation, just at, at, like at a very grassy, grass-stained, grassroots level, but it's great work. What has been, if any, the community engagement ahead of utilizing the CSI dollars to bring on a fuels mitigation manager? Well, there's there hasn't, as far as like doing community outreach on whether we need that or whether we don't need that, um, there hasn't been any because we know we need. Um, it's a space where we as a, a fire agency um, haven't had staff available to kind of move into the modern era of how how we do public outreach. Um, and that's what we're learning through the Western Fire Chiefs and some work through Oregon State University is kind of the traditional send out a flyer or do a TV ad. Those are not effective ways to discuss evacuation planning, um, fuels reduction work, the type of really community risk reduction or resilience uh, planning that this position will be responsible for. Um, and they, are, they and their office uh, or their um, task list will be um, helping work with the neighborhood organizations in our highest threat areas to determine what their needs are, what their education needs are, um, and really build and develop uh, kind of a top tier plan here, uh, Eugene Springfield Fire. There's another right. component of the program or other funding source that we're pursuing right now that will also uh, hopefully bring a public information officer into the fire department um, that will be teamed up with with this position and this work. What communities um, in Oregon, if any, are are you looking to um, that are doing excellent fuel reduction work? Uh, Ashland comes to mind. Is there are there any best practices either statewide or regionally that that Eugene Springfield Fire look to? Yeah, so um, the recently retired chief from Jackson County Fire District 3, uh, which surrounds a lot of the Medford uh, area, um, they he's leading the effort with the Western Fire Chiefs and working with Oregon State University in cataloging the programs that are working well and aren't working well, not just in Oregon, uh, but in the Western region, um, really modeling off uh, Boulder, Colorado has a really great wildfire uh, planning and, and mitigation program that's kind of a an all-in effort, multiple legs of that school, the fire department's role, uh, the city's role, the county's role, and then the citizens' role in um, accessing the available tools to reduce the risk of wildfire around their home in their neighborhood. Great. And finally, there's there's state dollars that that um, are deployed to county homes. Um, my my in-laws utilize this, this piece. They received a grant uh, if they um, re removed uh, you know, fire ladders that are near their, their, their home. Do you see an opportunity to tap into statewide dollars or even federal dollars for the, a similar program within the municipality for homes that might uh, butt up against or within close proximity to the urban growth boundary? Um, is that is that something you you see in 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 your in the crystal ball uh, around the corner? Yeah, absolutely. There. So the the two parts to this the request that went through the CSI was not only for a physician to do the work, but materials and support, uh, materials and services support to um, help fund grant writing, help move through some of those community education materials, and then last but not least, uh, mechanisms for. Uh, fuels reduction ability, whether it's you know chipper days or sites where people can take their their fuels to um, leveraging off of um, a number of departments in the Portland metro area that are offering uh, similar services, basically grants. You can rent a chipper yourself. There's there's a number of ways that that we're going to be able to leverage those dollars based on um, our community needs assessment. Okay, great. Thank you, Chief. Thank you, Manager. And thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. That was a great line of questioning. Uh, Alan, you're up. Uh, thank you. Um, interested in the university district closure and its impact. Mm -hmm. I understood that the ATOP increase, that makes sense, but that's how much time it's taking and, and 
how much wall time we have. Um, but do you have any sense of the impact on health outcomes? Did we see any adverse health outcomes as a result of that, that you know of, or that we track? Um, it would be really difficult within kind of our response data metrics of, you know, did the, the university closure uh, result in a, an adverse outcome for somebody? Um, you know, maybe people who access care at McKinsey Willamette, because they, I think they saw the biggest share of, of census increase in all of this. Um, and we've definitely seen some increased challenges there with who's having to administer additional drugs to sedate folks while they're waiting for uh, patient care transfer at that facility. So potentially, yes. Um, are those, you know, life or limb threatening? Um, probably unlikely. Um, those calls usually get prioritized when we transport. Yeah, and for years before the closure at University District, we were already transporting life safety over to Riverbend anyway for several years before this. So that didn't that didn't change. It's just the amount of time we spent doing some of that stuff mm -hmm. is what's increased, right? Yep. Um so other question I had was about the impact of uh cahoots being down on on all of that system as well. So Maybe you could describe what Coots wasn't able to do for a while, and how that, and and, and let us know how that impacted the system. Um, <laughs> so even before, like the if the question is directly around the ice storm, um, you know that's unit availability. December was our kind of lowest Cahoots availability month, and so we track when they're in service and and not in service. Um, they acknowledged when we did the contract extension that they. Um, we're going to be able to provide uh, 36 hours of coverage for the city. And so um, that went down to a minimum of 24 and they didn't quite meet that um, in December. During the ice storm, they were incredibly busy like everybody else for the hours that they weren't available. Um, we saw um, in you know, particular Springfield where there were much bigger gaps um, in service that um, and same thing here as police officers stepped into that role. and. You know, Chief Skinner's not a part of this presentation, but the conversations that we had, and normally during significant weather events like this, um, fire call volume spikes, police call volume um, drops a little bit. But what we saw is, is you know, usually the police department are picking up those calls for service. Um, and it's available. Yeah, I, was, I was more interested in the fact that Coos lost their licensed supervisor oh. on the medical side. Yeah. And couldn't perform certain duties and how was that impact? The ice storm is an anomaly. So yeah. That would... Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah. So um, basically what happened there is their existing physician advisor um, was finishing. They're working on trying to get somebody in. There was kind of some contractual issues that caught them off guard for a few weeks. I think they're um, signing, I believe this week is what I understand um, with the new physician advisor. Um, and so that did have some impact, um, basically for things that had a medical uh, component to them. They were calling our crews to come do a, a, an evaluation because they just they couldn't do it. As an EMT, if you don't have a physician advisor, you can't do EMT work. And so they were calling on us to, to help facilitate those evaluations. Um, wasn't an incredible increase in, in call volume for us. Um, because the rest of the work that they have that physician advisor for like wound care and some of the other um, really kind of minor medical issues um, to support, particularly the unhoused community, um, that is where the biggest impact would be. And they had to navigate other kind of resources to get folks that care. And I think they did a good job um, being creative to get through that. So they, they typically under perform on the contract in December. Is that what I heard you say? Is is the new ideas that we're coming up with for the next iteration of this going to address some of those underperformance issues? Yeah, and they they are already, I think, making um, some significant leaps in that that space with how they're scheduling staff. Um, they're reporting to us that their staff are um, pretty happy with kind of 
how they scheduled out the next three months. Um, they're feeling confident in their ability to meet those contractual needs. Um, and so it really was just, uh, I think, some organizational expectations, how they do their work um, that they've been working through. And, you know, they're in, I think, the 11th hour working through trying to get to uh, a union contract with their representing Teamsters members. Yeah, there's a lot going on at the union contract and our con our needs and all mm -hmm. that change at the state level. So, yeah, um, they're an incredible valuable asset to the community and 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 in response time for us and the ability to stretch our other people to do more. Uh, so they're very valuable. I guess, and the last point uh, on the wildfire planning and fuels mitigation work, I think that's super critical. Uh, that should be, that should be, we shouldn't forget last summer, especially uh, wildfires within the urban growth boundary in the Laurel Hill Valley area was, um, pretty frightening for a lot of people. Um, I could stand on my property over there and, and see the fire. Uh, that's never happened before. So I th we shouldn't lose sight of how important that is. And it's gonna become, unfortunately, with climate change, more and more of a common thing and a, and a bigger and bigger deal. So the faster we can do that, the more resources we can put into that and the more education we can do with, with, um, with homeowners and property owners, the better off we're gonna be. So really important work. Glad you're doing it. Yeah, we agree. Last year, the Moon Mountain Fire, I mean, that's the biggest biggest and highest threat fire that we've experienced in the um, urban interface environment uh, in our service area. Uh, we got lucky. And, uh, you know, when we think about the fact, especially um, in the middle of the heat of the day like that, um, it's often that we don't have very many fire resources that are already committed to other calls. Um, so that's why we're focused on, you know, also how do we, how do we increase our ability to staff and and do that work. So we're we're looking forward to leveraging that planning. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, thank you. Thank you so much. And I Emily has her hand raised, and I just want a little time check with councils. Remember, we still have more presentations to go, and we're so I'm gonna I'm gonna Emily, I'll let you. Hopefully you can be succinct and on the next round, I'm going to shorten you all to two minutes uh, and maybe even one because we just want to get through everything. So Emily, take it away. Thank you. I just want to go back to the calls for overdoses and make sure I have this right. You get a hundred calls per month and of those 35 people die. Yep. More, more than a hundred um, often, you know, up to 140, 150, but the, the average is over a hundred. And then, yeah. Um, Average of 35 people or more die every. So basically, every day somebody dies from overdose. Correct. And um, do those happen while they're still with you, or do they get to the hospital and die? Uh, most all overdose deaths are are beyond help when we arrive. Mm -hmm. um, so we we have all the tools uh, to to bring people out of the overdose. Um, and so does the, the community has access to those tools now as well. But unfortunately, I, I, I keep Narcan on hand. I haven't had to use it for anybody, but I keep it. Um, is Cahoots involved? I know they can't now without medical supervision, but are they, um, do they go to overdose calls? They do. Um, and they help hand out Narcan. I mean, they're, they're kind of on the front end of, of that, uh, Farm prevention, I guess, is the best way to put it, is, is to try to give people tools, not only access to care um, and, and rehab support, but um, also the tools to, to correct an overdose. And is that included with the 100 plus calls a month that CAHOOTS responds to? Yeah, because we're being dispatched to those calls too. Okay, great. And, and um, just one, another question. Um, if you call 988, what do you get? because I'm not really familiar with that. Um, it's navigation to uh, behavioral health support services. So again, similar to, to 911, um, once the system is fully functioning, and I'm not sure that it is fully functioning at this point, um, Councilor Leach probably has uh, more information on that than I do, but uh, that, I mean, it's, it's supposed to work that way. It's supposed to direct people to resources and in worst case scenario, back into the 911 system if they're, um, in a tremendous amount of crisis. So somebody else answers those, not the 911. Okay, right. great, thank you. 
Okay, Lindsay, uh, quickly, and then we'll move on. Thanks. Yes, thank you for giving me a minute. Um, I I want to say thank you so much for your leadership and for all of our first responders during this tough time. Um, my question is because I'm getting a lot of um, communication from constituents, particularly in the Whitaker, about um, warming fires um, and kind of the response times or lack of response to some of those that feel dangerous to people, um, like if they're you know against a building or they're left unattended um, or under tree cover. Um, could you remind us um, of the protocol and what to do if like there's nobody to be able to respond because everybody is already busy or on other calls. Yeah, so um, when we're not in fire season, uh, we don't respond to uh, what are termed illegal burning complaints. Um, those are often the warming fires, those types of things. Uh, however, uh, any fire threatening a building um, or opposing uh, any kind of uh, community risk uh, should get a response from fire. So. For those constituents that, that you know it, it, we didn't respond um it's important that we know um if that's the case or not um and we've checked into some others um they weren't up against the building they weren't um posing a, a threat uh, we understand the, the feeling that, that folks have um but at the same time it's kind of this challenging space um you know when people are struggling to, to survive and it's not posing a, a threat to spreading um, and then the other is if those fires are unattended, um, that should initiate a, a response from fire to go uh, manage that and put it out. So um, there's always things in, in protocols or you know information given um, that doesn't fit what the uh, the call is, um, that there can be misses, um, but those are always opportunities to learn. And so when we hear about those, um, we work with the, the dispatch supervisors to make sure that um, given the information at hand that the response was appropriate or um, also guide, you know, if, if there's a miss on on our protocols to respond or not respond, that, we're, that we get it right. Wonderful. Is there keywords that people should use if they are, really are concerned that might trigger a, um, a higher level of response? Obviously, if it's true. <laughs> yeah, that, that's the challenge in the 911 system is oftentimes people do use keywords to trigger a response when you know, there's not a threat. Um, but again, if it's up against a building, if it's threatening, uh, you know, vehicles, lives, um, then that's a problem. Right now, um, this time of year, uh, again, the, the risk of a fire spreading or a warming fire spreading is um, pretty much not there. Uh, but when fire season rolls around, we do respond and we do put those fires out. Wonderful. Thank you so much again. Okay, thank you. Chief, I'm going to release you to do the next round of your presentation. Thank you. <laughs> I promise this part is brief because uh, I know there's a lot of other team members that uh, have great work for their teams to share. Um, ESF was incredibly busy out on the front end of, of this call. Um, we saw an incredible spike in, in call volume. Basically, on an average week, we respond anywhere between 850 and 1,000 calls. Last week, we caught 1,664 calls or 3,000 unit dispatches. Uh, our busiest day was 608 unit dispatches on the 15th. We transported uh, almost 600 people, 241 fire calls for fire responses, and 19 CO responses or carbon monoxide uh, from generators, things like that. Uh, the majority of those were in Springfield, the carbon monoxide, uh, because they had such uh, kind of extended power outages, challenges like that. Um, for us here at FIRE, um, despite some very unfortunate events south of us uh, in the Cottage Grove area, where I believe that the second um, person died from a house fire last week, which was their second fatal house fire, a number of other storm-related deaths, um, we haven't gotten any reports of specific directly storm-related deaths in our response area. Uh, which speaks a lot to our community's ability to care for themselves. When we think about um, who we're serving, especially um, in our warming centers or EGAN and, and those, um, as we think about the, the um, after action discussions and reports, it's important to not forget um, those warming centers and respite centers. Um, you know, a lot of people are just like, well, you know, we're, we're helping get the unhoused out uh, of the elements. The reality is in a storm like this, 
um, it's everybody. It's our family members, um, it's our elderly population, it's our disabled population. I mean, it's everybody that needs extra help and no way to get out or get to those places or get to their medications. Um, it's a very diverse population and we're already working, you know, um, uh, Chief Campy, our EMS chief, uh, sat on a meeting with uh, today, Department of Emergency Management in California, talking about access to emergency, access to um, all of our disaster plans. Like, because we have something, th does that mean everybody can get to it? And if not, how do we get to them? Um, and so uh, this storm will teach us a lot um, as we move forward and, and kind of plan for uh, caring for our community where they are um, in, in the ways that they need care for. Um, but Throughout this event, we did stand up uh, two extra squads, uh, extra ambulance and a battalion chief and dispatch uh, to help us mitigate calls to catch the additional um, call volumes. Despite that work, uh, at one point, I think the highest threshold of calls pending that we had no resources to answer was 38. Um, and the battalion chiefs helped sort out, like, is this something that needs a response? Is there somebody else that can care for that? But most importantly is as a resource would become available, going through that list of calls and saying which one has the most dire need um, to respond. As I mentioned earlier, as, we're, as we think of, about going forward and, you know, the fact of how busy our fire department's gotten without adding staffing um, and being out on a daily basis, just sunny and nice and warm. Um, now imagine adding 600 calls in that week to, to care for. So if we run out of resources normally, um, this storm had a big impact. Uh, I want to shout out to uh, our crews, did an amazing job. Nobody had any significant time loss injuries with no significant vehicle damage. Despite, as we've celebrated early access to people in this career, a lot of young folks driving ambulances, um, they did a great job. Um, addition to that, the people you don't see, public works and folks that are out there clearing streets for us, helping us get places, the Sanders, the fleet team, that came in and worked 24 hours a day, um, not only helped keep us going in the city of Eugene, they actually helped some of our units in Springfield um, in the middle of the night, get up and get going again uh, when they had some mechanical failures. And so there was a lot that went into this. Um, there was a lot of our communities uh, in particular on the other side of the freeway in Springfield um, where our vulnerable folks who our normal people, there are neighbors um, who needed help, needed, you know, movement to respite centers and things like that, that um, really shown the need for uh, our work, our planning, um, and future planning to make sure that um, that we're ready to, to meet that. So all in all, um, fire department did a great job. Um, the staff that, that are out there doing the work, um, we were busy, we made it through it. Um, we dodged some bullets here in, in Eugene um, from what we saw the city of Springfield uh, experience. But that's all I've got on the ice storm. I know Matt and his team have a lot of great work to share as well. Great. Yeah, I Thank think it'd be, it'd be good if we just roll into yep. that. Yep. That's what I was going to suggest. So let's so, just do I'm going to turn it over to Matt Rodriguez. Thanks, Sarah. Chief, can you unshare your screen real quick working on it there we go i'll see if i can get the right screen up for mine all right does that look like the presentation okay go off all right, so um, I'm uh, Matt Rodriguez, Assistant City Manager and Public Works Director. Thanks for letting me take a little bit of time to talk about some of the other teams that were out working the storm um, last week. I just want to echo what Chief Caven said. It's just I'm incredibly grateful to all the folks in the city that were out working this event to keep the community safe and keep our essential services running. It's um, it's not just the folks you typically think of as first responders or the, the person in a, an ambulance, a fire truck, police car, a, a snow plow. It's all the folks working to support them, as he said. And I'm not gonna be able to talk about all those folks, but just wanna express gratitude for them as we go through this. All 
All right. So um, as you know, this was really an unprecedented event. Uh, really, we not only had one ice storm, we had two uh, building on each other. During this event, we were really in constant coordination with partners, you know, Lane County, City of Springfield, UWeb, the school districts. We're really all talking in the background, trying to figure out how to navigate this together. Um, there were some hard decisions that needed to be made, not only for the city, but with other partners around um, closing facilities because of power outages, damage, street conditions to keep people to work and, and just let people report safely. Um, I want to give a shout out to our library, recreation and cultural services teams that did work really quickly to reopen our downtown library and uh, branch libraries and community centers as they were able on Wednesday the 17th after the second storm, realizing that having those open to the public was really important. And many city staff continued to work through this event if they did have power and internet at home, um, in addition to the first responders that were out on the streets doing work. One of the things Chief Cabin said that I just want to echo is, you know, while we're moving out of response, we're in, into recovery, and knowing that's going to take a while, especially for some of our neighboring communities, we realize that the kind of unprecedented scale and impact of services from this event mean there's, there's a lot to talk about um, through the after action and, and think about how we can show up uh, as a community um, to you know, serve the community and keep our services running the next time we have an emergency. So just a lot of learning opportunities. So I'm going to talk a little bit about public works response. When you think of public works, you're probably thinking about seeing uh, snow plows out in the street and, and folks out there with chainsaws clearing trees. And that is a lot of the work that we do. There's really three, I would say, kind of core areas and, and two of them I just mentioned. So plowing and sanding streets, applying de-icer um, as, as it's possible and effective. This was an interesting storm in that the level of ice really made de-icer not very effective. So we often get questions from the public about why aren't the streets completely clear when you have something like this where you have multiple layers of ice building um, the icer isn't going to do it for you so the main work we focus on is making sure we're plowing our um, priority one and priority two routes and sanding them to make sure they're as as drivable as possible and as many of you who may have actually tried to drive in this event no that was still a tricky thing and especially on side streets that didn't have that kind of application uh, clearing trees we really focus on the right of way again it's about making sure that all of our first responders uh, including public works can have access that eweb can get where they need to go that police and fire and ems can get where they need to go we work on tree issues in in parks as well but that's really secondary um, as you uh, may know we actually uh, instigated a ice and snow emergency on January 13th, which means can't park on our um, priority snow routes, but we also closed the parks knowing that we were going to have a lot of tree damage from ice as we have in past events. So that's really the work that our crews are starting to get to now, and I'll speak a little more about that later. Also, some things people don't think about are airport operations and wastewater treatment plant operations, with, which are also incredibly critical. I'll speak to those as well. And then while not part of Public Works, I do want to give a shout out to our facilities team that's working to assess uh, damage, um, power availability to our buildings, and making sure that they're safe for folks to use. So these are some numbers. I won't uh, talk through all of them, but related to our public works response and um, plowing application of sanding rock to streets. You know, you can see that we've got some pretty big numbers there. You know, for example, 290 cubic yards of sanding rocks, about, you know, 29 dump truck loads. One thing to keep in mind is not only do we have the work of, of putting that out to help people during the emergency, we also have to clean that up and that takes a while to do. So our sanders are really, um, our sanders, our, our street sweepers are out really trying to collect all that rock again and make sure we get it off the street because it can become a safety hazard after the event while it's actually helping the public during the ICE event. 
So tree response, um, just a couple of pictures. If you've been out and about, you know that this storm was really hard on trees as have past ice storms. Even with that said, I think our initial um, assessment is that we've actually fared a lot better than some of the neighboring communities. And I, I think there's a couple of reasons for that. One is I think we just had a lot of damage in the past and some of the trees, you know, that would have been taken out in this ice storm were taken out in the last one. But also our teams, especially our urban forestry team, did a lot of work in trimming um, post the last emergency to make sure that trees were really in good condition. So when you see folks out in your neighborhood looking at tree trimming and you're wondering why they're doing it, it's to prepare for something like this and make sure our canopy is healthy. Um, so a lot more work to do there and a little bit of numbers on that. So about 664 active tree work orders, and we know there's going to be a lot more than that. They continue to trickle in. We're continuing to go out in the community. And, um, you know, while there were not a high number of complete, you know, failure of trees, you, you just see tree damage and limbs that will need to be taken care of um, all across town. We did have 17 work orders that were um, related to trees and power lines that we worked jointly with EWIP to address, and some of those are still in progress. So uh, Public Works Airport and wastewater, you know, when you think about the way that our streets and our front yards looked during this emergency and then think of our runways and our taxiways, which is one big piece of pavement, um, after the second ice storm, our airport staff did an incredible job, um, you know, just working the runway and the taxiways to get the ice removed and actually open the runway by 1030, which was a couple hours before schedule and make sure that we were ready when the airlines would be ready to service the airport. Public Works wastewater team, um, you know, they kept up operations uninterrupted, which is really saying something an event like this where we have multiple power outages uh, across the city we did have some generators that needed to be deployed to run pump stations without power predominantly those for the most part were in springfield because we do have regional pump stations across the metro area and then another thing is you know when we have the meltwater we end up with really high flows to the wastewater treatment plant so I think our peak in the last week has been just over 200 million gallons per day. That's about seven times the amount of flow we have in dry weather, which is typically a, a bit over 30 million gallon days. So a lot of work by the team there. So Eugene Police, um, one of the things that, you know, that, that team really pivoted to be able to show up for the community in whatever way uh, they needed. And one of the ways that shows up is the number of welfare checks. So I think all of last year, EPD had 100 welfare checks and they've had 141 just this year. And that's for, you know, maybe older folks um, that had out of town relatives calling, saying they couldn't communicate, and were worried about them, our unhoused community. Uh, we redeployed uh, police vehicles along with um, Eugene Springfield Fire is, you know, as, as Chief Cabin said, kind of community caretaking transportation to make sure people got to warming sites, um, doing wellness checks, and also making sure our 911 call center staff could make it into work. So, you know, we had over just, well, actually, it's just under 2,500 calls for EPD from the 13th to the 21st. Another one of those kind of unsung heroes is our central lane communications team who's working behind the scenes to make sure that we can get our emergency services out to where they need to be. Um, we had a, a high on Monday the 15th of just over 2,100 calls, which is more than double basically the previous Monday. So if you think about the escalation of need from the 13th to the 21st, they had just over 17,000 calls compared to the same period last year, which was just over 11,000, so really a spike. The team did an amazing job of getting that done. A little bit about eWeb response. We asked eWeb to, um, you know, give us some information so we could help share it here. You know, there was questions um, 
about water and the way that we might, as a community, handle um, an event like Springfield went through with uh, needing a boil notice for water. We had no service interruptions for water in Eugene, but um, eWeb does have a really robust plan about notification, including uh, reverse 911 and being able to auto dial their customers directly or just a few of the things they could do if needed to let the community know if there was a problem. Regarding electric service, over a third of the electric service territory was you know, significantly affected, uh, likely impacting on the order of 120,000 people. You know, eWeb uh, stood up their incident command system and had crews working 16-hour days. I, I believe they still do to try and get power back up for folks. Over 250 eWeb personnel and 50 uh, contracted line workers have been working to address issues and restore power for the community. Um, most of the larger outages in Eugene have been taken care of by now, and it's the crews really focusing on kind of single customer outages that are scattered across the city. All the, the bulk of the remainder, as we understand it, of service that they need to restore for their customers is actually upriver. Um, and so far, they've actually restored over 36,000 services, so really an amazing job. Um, one thing that I did want to touch on with water again is, I apologize I missed, is that one of the reasons that we really didn't have the issue with water is because of investments in the water treatment plant. And eWeb shared that there's been over $35 million put into the Aid Bridge drinking facility and distribution system that really helped it be resilient, including backup power generation, not only Aiden Bridge, but other critical facilities. So that kind of emergency management and resilience work eWeb has done really paid off during this uh, storm response. And that's actually all I have. Turn it back to you, Mayor. Mayor actually just wanted to say uh, one additional thing. Uh, thank you, Matt and Chief Caven. What a great presentation. But I also wanted to share one line from, and I'll share more information that Frank shared, but uh, in Frank's estimation, this was probably the worst, the single biggest loss of, of transmission lines. So high voltage, long distance, including Bonneville Power Administration and our local region's history. So when you think about, you know, the level of impact and, and where people are deployed, uh, we, we just passed through a pretty massive, you know, regional issue, maybe our worst. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I, you know, it's just that report, the scale of it is just the numbers you're citing are, are just mind boggling. So thank you. Thank you for that. And thank you for the incredible hours and hard work that people put in to respond at that level is just amazing. So thank you. Uh, all right. I have Mike, then Matt, then Alan. Mayor, I put my hand down. I, I actually, I, I will ask the question, though. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, to Matt, I would just say that um, my understanding is that eWeb e typically um, notifies customers with an email, which during a power outage, I'm I'm not sure, and an internet outage, I'm I'm not sure exactly how how helpful that is. Um, I I had heard of several um, questions about their communication system, and and I'm just hyping up to say, I hope they, they learn from the process and refine their public information as they go. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Matt. And then Alan. Thanks mayor. I, uh, I want to express my appreciation to, uh, to Matt and the chief and the entire, uh, public works and first responder teams as well. Twice I called, uh, public works, um, during this inclement weather emergency, uh, once for, um, uh, I noticed that there are trees leaning against the, the lines behind our house, um, as they abut to 30th Avenue. There's a, there's, I can see a frayed downed line right now. So I suspect I'm probably one of those, um, still in progress calls. It is an insulated call, uh, line, but, um, every time I called public works, whether it was a downed or a felled tree branch, um, uh, uh, in the middle of the roadway or or the incident I just alluded to in regards to the the wires, I was met with an, 
a, a responsive, intelligent, compassionate, caring individual on the other side of that phone call. And it was so appreciated at a very human level. So please uh, underscore, italicize, and bold my gratitude for the folks who put in those hours and who got to work in most dangerous uh, situations to answer those calls. So thanks for, for the folks who are on the other end of 682-4800. Um, thankfully, we didn't have to call 911, but my appreciation to the 911 operators, obviously, as well. Big City Gaming stepped up big time, uh, but our schools and our library and other public buildings were largely remained closed. Do we have adequate public shelter sites for such inclement weather related emergencies? So, Counselor, I don't I don't know that I am the best person to be able to answer that. I, I, I think what I can say is that we know, especially in an event like this, that that's one of the things that really needs to be uh, debriefed as part of the you know larger community partners. Um, you know, as we know, for warming centers, Egan, the county works with Egan to set those up. I think we have heard from them some of the extreme challenges that they had and concerns they had during this event, especially with um, transportation services, you know, stopping and not having the typical um, day respite centers like the library and community centers available. So it, I, I think there's a lot to to talk about. And, uh, and how we do it differently in the future. Thanks. And thank you. And appreciation to the Egan volunteers as well. And finally, in my few final seconds, Mayor, I want to thank KLCC uh, for the information uh, regarding closures and weather related information. Um, so thank you to our KLCC uh, public works team, folks in the private sector like Big City Egan, and Egan, uh, Egan Warming Centers, and of course, EWEB. Thanks. Hey, thank you. Alan, and then. Oh. Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to uh, also say thank you to all the all the city employees, that, uh, fire, the police, and the public works people, and all those people behind the scenes uh, that put in really long work uh, in the cold, in the dark, at all through very long hours. Um, all that behind the scenes work um, and all the folks that did that. Uh, and they're the, really the unsung, unseen here, heroes of, of all this, as well as the utility folks that web and all the people that came from other communities. It takes so many people to, to actually make this, get us through the night, so to speak, and also during the recovery and to keep our city working. And I just hope Eugenians um, realize that and are grateful for all that work that, that you never saw that allowed us to actually make it through this uh, as, as well as we did. Um, granted, there's still a bunch of people out, including my other house that doesn't have power yet. Um, but uh, we made it through. It could have been a heck of a lot worse. So thank you to all of those people that did all that work. Matt, make sure they know it, that the council is really appreciative of it. And I think most of the city of Eugene is also appreciative of it. Appreciate that, Councilor Zelenka. And one thing my, I just got reminded about is that I wanted to throw a shout out to our traffic operations team because they were also running around town placing generators to keep traffic signals up as um, as we were experiencing power outages. But, but I'll definitely do that. Thank you. Thank you. Lindsay. Yes, thanks again. Um, I am wondering, because I just saw Link County alert um, that another storm could be on the way um, starting next week. And if we are currently... Um, trying to prepare ourselves for another um, similar storm or what we could be doing better to uh, meet the next challenge. Well, Councillor Leach, I think you actually uh, got ahead of me. I hadn't heard from my staff <laughs> we were expecting that. What I can tell you is um, we, we, we train for storm response every year, whether there's a storm or not. Um, that I, I think there are very, some very particular issues from this storm that we need to debrief, but our, our, our crews are ready and adaptable and, and ready when the community needs us. Um, we do have some after actions this week with partners about how we responded to the storm, and I think that's probably an opportunity to see what this 
next one, if it comes in, might hold and how we can work together even better. Wonderful. Yeah, I think in in terms of emergency preparedness uh, throughout our city on the individual level and intergovernmental level, I think there's still room for improvements and especially with our alert systems and um, communications to people. And so just trying to see how we can learn our lessons and, and do better um, as we move forward. So thank you for all of your work and um, and and good job. <laughs> thank you, uh, Jennifer. Yeah, so um, I just had a question about continued uh, work in this area. It sounds like we're going to do more debriefs. I, you know, this kind of stuff takes time. I recognize, like a few days later, you haven't figured out the whole picture and where the gaps were and what we can do better. So, um, and I'm particularly interested in how we did, how our, some of our partners did as well um, around, especially around like food insecurity. I know that a lot of folks, it doesn't take long before they're out of food um, and going out in a nice storm, depending on where they live was probably impossible, right? So, but I mean, that's not a city service. That's often our partners that are doing that, but it would be nice to know how that happened. So this is a very long segue into the question of, how are you, is there a way to get back to us? Um, even if it's just a memo on how um, those conversations went and where there are gaps that we might wanna keep in mind, even if it's not necessarily the city's job to fill those gaps, just so we're aware. I, I appreciate that, Councillor Yeh. I, I think there is. I, I, that's something that I can coordinate with the city's emergency manager. Um, she is, probably you know lead and in more of the the whole community picture conversations that would be able to bring back information as we you know go through our after action debriefs of here are the gaps and the things we want to think about differently moving forward so i i can talk with her about that thanks that would be fantastic thank you any other counselors with questions or comments i just want to uh I so appreciate this report and it's uh, this back to back, the big conversation with all the things going on with with Eugene Springfield fire from Chief Caven and this and uh, these are there, there's these huge shifts in this. I mean, the what Eugene Springfield fire is doing is this sort of there's at every level, there are sort of organizational shifts and changes in how they function. And now we're we're then looking at the city and our response to this really extraordinary storm. And and so among the gaps, as, as people think about the gaps, it, it felt to me that there were not accidents here necessarily, but certainly accidents in Portland where people didn't know how to respond to a downed power line, for instance, right? The people who power line fell on the car and they got out and were electrocuted. And so I guess, you know, as we think about that, and as we think about the potential a Cascadia event, earthquake, like kind of having that sort of cheat sheet too of what do people actually know about safety <laughs> and where might they have an impulse that's really not the safest impulse. And um, so, I, you know, I, in this sort of larger, not the immediate debrief, but in that sort of larger preparedness question, that piece, I'm also was struck by the fact that Springfield schools were uh, were not safe and that that was an issue for the Springfield schools. And again, when we think about emergency preparedness, we've often thought about the schools as sort of those safe places, right? They're reinforced and safer. And so I, 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 there hasn't been really much of a mention of the school districts. And, but that feels to me that the other, as Jennifer's asking about community partners, that the school district and where they are and, and how that sort of fits into our overall planning feels really, uh, critical. I, I also think an incredible moment for individuals to actually reconsider how prepared they are for emergencies. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm I'm running over now, but I'm taking a moment of privilege as, as the mayor to just, again, reinforce my gratitude to all of the people I'm thinking that my job was just to stay out of the way and stay safe and not need, a, need an ambulance to the hospital myself. And that was clearly the simplest job of anybody in the city and that other people had to had to show up and deal with 
incredibly challenging circumstances and we have enormous gratitude and um i actually had sent a note to the governor who had asked how we were doing and i sent a note and i said well all the teams are great and they're all pulling in the same direction and i'm proud of them so um it really well well done and thank you for this report and um if there are no other questions or comments i think we are actually adjourning four minutes early <laughs> thank you so much thank you mayor